You're listening to the Love Over Addiction Podcast. Hey, so I'm sitting on the front porch outside. I just finished eating lunch and I wanted to talk to you today about anger. Here's the deal, especially if you're a woman, and I know that slightly sounds sexist, but hang with me. If you are a woman and you are dealing with feelings of anger, most likely you're feeling ashamed or embarrassed because typically the story that we've been told is that women don't behave Women don't get angry, right? We're reasonable, we're calm, we're maternal, we're soothing, we're empathetic, we're soft, we're gentle. And anything other than that makes us feel really angry. I mean, (laughs) anything other than that, anything outside of that, especially anger, makes us feel really ashamed and embarrassed and wrong. I know when I was married to a great man who suffers from addiction, I felt anger a lot of the time. Whether I was saying I was angry or whether it was just bubbling below the surface, I was angry at so many things. I was angry that he wasn't getting sober. I was angry that my life had become this broken and desperate. I was angry at myself for staying in a relationship that practically I know I should be leaving. I was angry at him for lying. I was angry at drugs and alcohol for ripping the man I loved away from me. I was angry at the people in his life for not helping me out and stepping in and having my back and getting helping me get this man sober. I was angry at rehab because it didn't work and the rehab facility that he went to and I like was a single mom with three young kids while he got massages, acupuncture and did all sorts of therapeutic stuff. It didn't work. It bought us three days in, of sobriety and then he went back to his addiction and I was angry about that. I was angry that there was no stories or no women or no other people talking about what the heck is going on in their families and and that addiction is just ripping away and stealing our loved ones. And I was angry about that there was nothing positive about it either. Like it was doom and gloom. Everywhere I turned for help, it gave left me even more depressed because nobody was having any answers and everything just had all of these jargons that like slogans or generic expressions, but I didn't know how to practically put them into um, practice and it left me feeling really desperate and alone and I'm, so of course I was angry about that. I was angry that I looked at my kids and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? I chose to have these babies and I can't bring them up in a safe home. And I was angry for them. And I was terrified that they were going to blame me when they grew up and caught on to what was actually going on. I was just angry. And that's not a feeling that I felt great about. So I was angry at feeling angry. I was judging myself for feeling this way. And then I came across, well, I worked through it. But today I came across a book that reminded me of this time in my life. And I wanted to share it with you. It has nothing to do with addiction. Because I'm finding most of the answers that really make a difference usually don't have to do with addiction. This is called The Book of Ichigo Ichi. I don't know if I just said that right. You're like, say what, Michelle? Um, those of you that are, in ja- that are Japanese know what I'm trying to say, but are probably laughing because I just butchered your beautiful language, and I apologize. It's called, I, it's, I believe, Ichigo Ichi is the way you pronounce it. 
The subtitle is The Art of Making the Most of Every Moment, The Japanese Way. And I just thought, that's something I haven't researched or dived into yet. And that sounds really beautiful. So let me take a look. So I grabbed the book off the bookshelf. And um, I'm going to read from page 36 really quickly. Basically, the authors are saying there's four basic emotions. Okay. And today we're just going to focus on one of them. And that is ding, 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 anger. You guessed it. So here we go. Anger. This emotion linked to our survival instinct originally helped us face danger that threatened us or our loved ones. Okay, full stop. Y'all get where I'm going with this? Anger is linked to our survival instinct and helped us. Anger helps us face danger and or things that threaten us or our loved one. Okay, when we love someone suffering from addiction, like, of course we feel threatened. Our future feels threatened. Our marriages feel threatened. Our, our finances feel threatened. Our safety sometimes feels threatened. You know, our kids' happiness feels threatened. Everything feels threatened. Everything feels like it's a second away from being taken away from us, right? And it we do face danger. I mean, for many of us, like having drug dealers as part of our lives, you know, we're like our loved ones have our, you know, quote, friends or have connections to drug dealers. That's, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if our loved ones are driving our children or ourselves around while intoxicated, or even just driving by themselves intoxicated, that's dangerous. Absolutely. Some of us um, are physically threatened or verbally abused. That's very, very much danger. And addiction, if if we are one of the rare people that are married to um, someone struggling with addiction and they don't, you know, they're, they are a safe person to be around, um, that's fine. But you still feel in danger because the drugs or alcohol are overtaking your loved ones. So um, what I wanted to say about that was that Basically, every anger that you're feeling, every threat or every emotion of anger or every threat that you are feeling um, is normal when you're in this situation. If you are feeling angry or upset, that is because... I'm so sorry. Hold on one second, please. Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm so sorry. I had to stop the pot. Did y'all hear that that background? This is live. Like, this is as real as it gets. So I, I told you guys I was sitting out on my front deck. So a family, cute, adorable family just walked by. And you guys know my saga with the dogs, right? I live in a, like, a very, like, everyone walks their dogs in our neighborhood. And I literally had to put signs out in my front yard that say, please don't let your dogs like poo or pee, like go potty in our, on our front yard because nobody picks it up. And then my kids like run around and get poo on them. And also I garden. And so like, I don't know about you, but I, I like to garden with my bare hands. And oftentimes I'll be like pulling weeds or gardening and my hand will start to smell like urine. Disgusting. Go ahead and vomit. I get it. Um, which is why I put the signs up in my yard. And so this, this family was just walking by. They literally saw me. This is hysterical. I just have to fill you in. Total side note. And the dog, they had a giant dog. And the dog just would pee on my side on the front yard that said, don't go to the bathroom on my yard. 
<laughs> oh, how funny. I mean, like, what are the... Of course, of course the dog was like, I'll show her. Let me tell her what I, how I feel about her stupid sides. And the, the, the wife just stood there letting her dog do it. Okay, so that's funny. Sorry I had to interrupt. I literally have like four signs in my front yard with that. Nobody's paying attention, Michelle. <laughs> my daughter the other day was like, Mom, maybe you need to get bigger signs. I was like, no, I don't think that's the problem. Oh, okay. So sorry, guys. I just had to share with you because that was really just like a disruption when I was trying to record this. Let's go back to anger, shall we? See, I could be angry about that. I am choosing not to. And let me tell you how you can choose not to be angry. So it is totally normal and acceptable to feel anger. But I want to share a little bit more about what the author said. And then we're going to talk to do, talk about what we are going to do with our anger right so the author continues um, by saying that's why our muscles become tense when we get angry preparing us to defend and counterattack, and our heartbeat gets faster our bodies produce adrenaline and noradrenaline optimizing our response to stress by eventually leading to exhaustion okay who can raise their hands at this and say, I get it. How many of us feel like we're riding a roller coaster ride while loving someone with addiction? It's like we go through really high highs where we have hopes that they're going to get sober and we believe their promises and only to be completely let down and go into very dark, low periods where we see them actively in their addiction or they abandon us and lead us, leave us to go hang out with the other people who they would choose to be with during their addiction. And we feel, of course we feel angry and we feel exhausted from this ride because truthfully, we never really thought that falling in love with them would come with this type of exhaustion and this type of ride. So the authors say, in addition to being socially undesirable, the problem with anger, and that's true, right, guys? Anger is socially undesirable. I mean, who likes to be around a really angry, ragey person? Is that it's rarely linked to any real threat. Okay, so this this is where all right, I hear the authors, but again, because this book is not about specific about loving someone with addiction issues, there are some of us that have experienced real threats, like physically real threats or financial real threats. Um, there, there are people in our community that have been physically abused or, you know, stranded without any money or cash because our loved one either has left us broke because they've used all the money on drugs and alcohol and drained their bank accounts, or they've, I mean, I know this happened to me. I know this has happened to other people. They go through your purse or your wallet and they take all of your bank cards out and they hold them hostage and they refuse to hand them over because they're afraid you're going to use them to leave. Um, and that's financial abuse. So it is, sometimes the threat is very real for us, okay? Now, the author continues, instead, we get angry when we believe we are victims of wrongdoing. Let me repeat that. We get angry when we believe we are victims of wrongdoing or when something that has happened to us is unfair. And addiction, another word for addiction is unfair. It's unfair to the person who's suffering, right? The person who is the addict, it's completely unfair. Most of them, well, none of them asked for this disease if it's a genetic predispos predisposition. And none of them asked for a difficult childhood or pain or trauma in their life and that they're using this as a coping mechanism because they don't have better coping mechanisms in place. 
And it's unfair to us, the ones who love us and unfair to the children. So it's just entirely unfair. The book continues, if we go on the attack, we often lose control and make the problems worse, right? Which is why in the programs we talk about when or how to talk to your loved one when they're suffering from addiction. We go into detail and actually give you specific lines, like a script prompts that you can use that are non-confrontational that will allow you to open up for dialogue. And we give you very strict boundaries on when to do that and more importantly, when not to do that. Um, so we lose control, we make the problem worse, and since then, the, the, sin, and then the other party also feels threatened and attacks in turn. That's usually what happens when we fight with our loved ones. We attack them, they attack us back. And in res response to our rage, we can do ourselves even more harm, right? So we just end up in a giant rage, even more angry than when we started. So the book says whether we attack or repress, because not everyone in our community deals with anger by getting it out. Some of us in this community just shove it down because we're so ashamed and we're not used to giving ourselves a voice. So we just push it, push it down and try to convince ourselves that it's our issue, that we shouldn't be angry in the first place. So whether you're attacking somebody or you're repressing somebody, the book says anger is almost always a destructive emotion. And then they reference Buddha and they said, Buddha taught holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burned. And I think that's very true. When we get mad, it's almost always due to our interpretation of something that has happened or that someone has done. I'm going to read that again because that's really good. When we get mad, it's almost always due to our interpretation of something that has happened or that someone has done. Therefore, anger keeps us tied to the past, preventing us from enjoying the here and now. Now, I know, I hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. And you're like, Michelle, um, you say that anger keeps me tied to the past but I also know I'm getting angry at their drinking and drug use and I know that they're not getting sober so that's also like I'm getting angry about my future because they're not getting better you know it's not that I'm upset about some memory in my childhood although you could be too it's that I'm mad that like next weekend there's going to be a game on and I know that they're most likely going or there's going to be some event or some get together and I know that my loved one is going to go out and get drunk or is going to get high or whatever and so you're upset about the future so how the heck do I enjoy the here and now when I'm constantly living in a state of anxiety about my future as well as anger about my past so here's what I'm going to tell you I'm going to use a, a story because I believe stories are the way that we learn. When I was at the scariest, worst part of my life, it was also the best part, the most enjoyable part of my life. And it was when I decided to, I was going to leave that I'd had enough of my marriage after being together over 10 years. And I was going to take my three young kids and I was going to find a way to leave. Now, remember, I was completely broke. I'd been a stay-at-home mom. I had, you know, no friends, no resources. I didn't actually know how I was going to make this happen. I just knew I was ready to make it happen. And like I've said to you guys before, leaving somebody who doesn't want to be left, who struggles with addiction, is dangerous and never easy. So I was dealing with a lot. I had three young kids I had to get a restraining order. I was hiding out in hotels. Um, it was bad. 
And it was also the absolute greatest time in my life. How is that possible? How can you go through trauma and have joy at the same time? Those seem like two very opposite emotions. Well, I could tell you one way it could have gone down is I could have stayed stuck in anger that, you know, he was refusing to pay for the electricity. So there's many times where I didn't, couldn't turn on the lights because, you know, I had to get a court order and call a lawyer on a Easter Sunday because I didn't have electricity in my house. I could have stayed stuck in anger and pissed that he was making it impossible for me to leave him. But instead, what I chose to feel was gratitude and joy that I was actually finally making progress, that I had arrived at the decision to do something with my life. And although I had many, many, many challenges along the way, I was so happy at the idea of doing something new. And this book talks about that on page 23, there is a word for it in Japanese. I'm going to butcher it again. Kaika? Kaika. I think that's what it's called. And what kaika means is when something unknown begins to blossom within us. Oh my gosh. I love, don't you love that? When something unknown begins to blossom within us. That is how I felt when I was deciding to take back my power, that I was no longer going to be a victim of addiction, and that I was going to do something different. I did not know. It was unknown what it looked like. I did not have all the answers. I didn't know where I was going to live or how I was going to get money or anything, but something was blossoming inside of me. So... Here comes the story. And some of you may have heard this before, but it's such a good story. I'm going to repeat it. So I was literally, I think I was, I was hiding out at a hotel under a fake name, paying cash because I was very worried for mine, my kids' safety. Um, and thank God I, I had a therapist who I would go to. And I was determined to continue to go to her during this time. In fact, I, she became my lifeline. So I went to her one evening. I got my car and I had, a, a, it was actually a group therapy appointment, this specific turn. And I said to the group, you know, guys, I am absolutely scared to death. I'm making this huge decision. I have no safety net. I have nothing. I don't know how this is going to pan out but it feels so good. And they were like, well, where is he? And like, are you worried? You clearly are worried for your safety. I said, truth be told, he might be waiting for me out in the parking lot right now to confront me. I don't know. Um, I know that I'm going to walk out of here. And there was one, one male, he was adorable. (laughs) There was one brave male who was in this support group with a bunch of other women. And he volunteered to walk me out to the car. Um, and I got in and I was like, yeah, he could be behind, he could be like following me home. But what I did was I got in my car and I just went through every single thing that I was grateful for. So I put on my seatbelt and I was like, I'm so grateful for the man that invented seatbelts so that I can be safe if I get into a car accident. I put on my favorite movie song at the moment which was Kanye West I think it was um Gold Digger I don't know why but that song really like (laughs) did it for me so I put on Kanye West blasted it on the radio rolled down the windows got on the highway and just sang along and pretended that I was like a rapper and I was so grateful for Kanye West for his music and picking me up and putting me in a good mood and allowing me to be goofy in a car. I was thinking about my mom who was babysitting my kids at home. And I was saying, I'm so grateful that I have a parent that has really stepped into my life to help me through this period. 
And then I thought, I'm so grateful. <laughs> this is gonna sound terrible, but that, that my kids are gonna be asleep when I get home because I'm exhausted. <laughs> and, I, and bedtime is really, really hard when you're a single mom and all you single moms understand that. So I'm like, I'm so grateful that they're gonna be peacefully sleeping and I don't have to do bath time and bedtime that I could just kiss them on the cheeks and tuck them in and feel love for them, but that I can go take a bath when I get home. And then I was like, I'm so grateful for baths. I'm so grateful that I have running water, warm, clean running water. And then I have, I, I have these like bath bombs that I can put in there um, I'm so grateful for the book that I was reading at the moment and so grateful for that author who had the courage to write the book. I was so grateful for my warm, cozy sheets that I was going to get into. Yes, they were old, but they also were really soft. And I loved that. I was so grateful that I could, even though I was going through this terrible time, that I could finally sleep at night in my own bed knowing that I didn't have to wait for him to walk through the door, not knowing if he was drunk or high or who he had been with, that I was going to sleep through the night and wake up when I wanted to wake up and not have to worry or carry that, that baggage anymore. It felt so good to be able to be in my home alone. The thing that I was afraid of the most of being alone became something that I was so grateful for once I was finally alone and I realized I had nothing to worry about. Do you see? Something inside of me was blooming because I was present in the moment. I was, could have easily sat there and worried about how the heck am I going to pay my lawyer bills? How the heck, where am I even going to move? Am I even going to stay in this state or am I going to go somewhere else? I could have easily gotten all worked up and all caught up in all of the details or all the possibilities of what he could have done to me or the kids. But instead, I stayed in the moment and I felt I allowed myself to enjoy whatever was blossoming inside of me. And I allowed myself to stay present and in the moment, which allowed me to feel grateful for what I had. And when I really looked hard enough, it was so much. I had so much. And I'm not talking about my bank account. I think I had like $7 in my bank account. Um, I'm talking about my soft, cozy sheets and clean water and a car with a seatbelt and kids and a family member that was helping me and three little nugget, delicious nuggets in their bed that I adore, that I would take care of and that I would dedicate the rest of my life to. A quiet, silent, peaceful home that finally I was in charge of the tone in that room and only me and finally me. And come hell or high water, I would not let anything jeopardize that tone or take that away from me again, ever. There was something blossoming and I was present in the moment to enjoy it. And that is what I think the Japanese are talking about. That is what we are talking about when we say that anger is okay. You guys, anger got me to be, to leave, to make the decision to go. I, I appreciate and value my anger. And damn straight I was angry, as you are. You're protecting, it's self-preservation, it's self-protection. Addiction is a threat to your life. But if you want to move through anger, you first of all cannot judge yourself. And then you, you need to be, allow something inside of yourself to blossom. Allow something new to begin, a new growth, a new dream, a new possibility. Something, a calling that is is that you need to answer and recognize even if you don't have all the answers figured out and I'm not talking it might be leaving for you it might not it might be something else and then be grateful in the moment be present in the moment because here's the deal okay it's very, very convenient and easy for us to sit there and get caught up in all of the drama and chaos that addiction brings into our lives. And that's what addiction wants you to do. Remember, we think of addiction as a third party in our relationship. 
There's us, there's the one we love, and then there's this third party called addiction. And we hate addiction. Addiction wants us to stay focused on the chaos, the, the trauma, the unfairness, the, because if we continue to stay distracted, we can prevent, it prevents us from getting healthy and better and in control. And addiction does not want us to get in control. Addiction wants us to stay weak so that addiction can maintain control. This is a battle between you and addiction for your future, for your mental health, for your safety. And so addiction will use anything to distract you. But if you are present in the moment and you talk yourself down off the ledge and you say, listen, 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 I I sure as heck can easily get angered here. But I'm going to choose to take a look at the things that I'll be in the moment and I'm going to choose to take a look at the um, trees right now. Like I'm looking at my trees in the backyard and they're swaying with the wind. And if I close my eyes, I can feel them and I can hear them and I, it can fill my heart. You, you have the equivalent of trees in your life right now. You do. So let's choose Let's choose to look around your surroundings right now. Think about all the things that are beautiful in your life and allow something to blossom within us. Something new, something beautiful, something spectacular, something special, something different. I know you can do this. Anger, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong. No judgment here. I don't judge you. You don't judge me. Okay? Let's walk through it, though. Let's not just park on anger. Let's work through that. Let's be responsible, mature adults and say, I'm angry, but I'm not going to stay angry. I'm going to choose to do something different. I'm going to take my power back from addiction I'm going to take some deep breaths. I'm going to realize that I am responsible for allowing myself to enjoy the moment. And I am not dead inside. There are still things that are blossoming inside of me. Addiction has not killed me. It is, instead, it is my opportunity to grow. And see, my dog Tubby agrees with you. She thinks so too. She's agreeing. Okay, guys, that's it for me this week. I hope you found something helpful. I love you guys. I believe in you. And I'll talk to you later. This podcast is created for your support, encouragement, and entertainment with my personal thoughts and beliefs. We are bonded together by the fact that we love someone suffering from addiction. This is not intended as a substitute for therapy or advice from a professional.